Thanks everybody for joining. We'll just give it a minute here as um, we'll enter the room. All right, I don't see the numbers going up anymore. So let's uh, let's get going. I'm Jeremy Rogers, the Director of Legal Affairs at Oregon Realtors. Welcome to today's class on the Oregon Realtors Buyer Advisory. Um, what we'd like to cover today is to first just uh, give an overview of the Oregon Realtors Forms training resources. Uh, some of you may be familiar with all of them, but I know that each time we do one of these classes, there's a lot of new folks participating, so we want to make sure that everyone is aware of the resources that are available. Uh, we'll show you where to find the buyer advisory. Uh, we want to talk about why you should use the buyer advisory, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that. Uh, when and how to use the buyer advisory. We'll take a look at the structure of the advisory and the topics that are covered in it. Um, we'll dive into a couple of selected topics, uh, time permitting. And then we'll have questions and answers. So uh, the first thing I want to do is take you to the website for the Oregon Realtors Forms uh, and just give you a quick tutorial about the additional training resources that are available to you. And then after that, we will I'll show you where you can find the uh, buyer advisory. So if you're um, if you don't already have this bookmarked, you should bookmark orforms.org. Uh, that is our forms website and the hub for all information about Oregon Realtors forms. And uh, on this website, uh, we have a tab called training. And if you click on that tab, you will be taken to our training library, which has several different um, formats of resources for you to learn uh, our forms. Uh, one of those is a self-paced trainings. And if you click on that button, you will see a, a series of trainings that are available for CE credit. Uh, most of those are cost $15 to process the credit. Uh, although we do have a baseline training in the Oregon Realtors Forms called Using Oregon Realtors Forms, which is a two hour course. That course is free. That course is taught by uh, principal brokers and uh, is an uh, overview of how to use our forms in the context of some specific uh, transaction scenario. So it's a very practical way to learn the forms, but we have a whole variety of other topics. In fact, uh, anytime we do one of these live trainings that you're participating in today, we record it and then we will move it over to the self-paced library so that uh, folks who weren't able to be here today can still access the training and uh, receive the CE credit. We've got trainings on a whole variety of topics, uh, death of a transaction, which focuses on defaults and terminations using the Oregon Realtors forms, navigating tenant occupied properties, navigating contingencies. We have a class specifically devoted to the distinctions between the Oregon Realtors forms and the uh, ORF forms, as well as the similarities between them. Uh, we have a class on our uh, client representation agreements, uh, including our listing agreement and our buyer uh, representation agreement. Um, so check those out. Uh, we also have uh, live trainings and webinars. That's what you're participating in today. Uh, if you click the link here, though, you'll see the schedule for all of those coming up. Uh, this actually is a schedule of all the courses that Oregon Realtors offering. So it includes some non-forms courses, but you'll see every Friday at 10, we do offer a forms related course. Um, so I encourage you to check out the list of the upcoming topics. We've got a lot of good uh, topics coming up. And then uh, we have our virtual open house at 11. That'll be happening right after this meeting. Uh, folks are welcome to join that after this meeting. But that's at 11 o'clock uh, a.m. every Friday. And either myself or our staff attorney, Nicholas Beasley, is available to answer any questions that you have about the forms, or accessing the forms, using the forms. It's really designed um, so that all of our members know that there's a time at least once a week where they can hop into a Zoom meeting and get whatever questions they have answered. Then we also have recorded tutorials. These are generally shorter videos 
uh, about a variety of topics, often not long enough to provide CE credit, but still really helpful information. So if you watch these, you're not gonna get CE credit, but you'll see a lot of good topics in there. Um, for example, uh, we have a video on lead-based hazards and lead-based hazards in context of the Oregon Realtor Forms. Uh, we have one on navigating um, uh, repairs, can't really find that one. Um, and then we have some of these you'll see are a repeat from the ones in the self-paced library. If you want to do those ones, I'd encourage you to do it in the self-paced library because those will be for credit in the self-paced library. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is our training um, version of our form. So we have the guided forms library, which are versions of our forms that actually have uh, video guidance embedded in them. So if you pull up, for example, the residential sale agreement, you will see these little video icons throughout this. Uh, if you click on the video, uh, the icon, a video will pop up explaining that section of the form. So this is designed so uh, that you always have a resource to go to to learn the form with some help. Um, our staff attorney, Nicholas Peasley, has done all the videos. We have the guided forms up for most of the forms, uh, but not all at this point. So if it's got a green, um, kind of highlight behind it, that means we have the form and you click on that and you will find it. If not, it says it's coming soon and we'll be uh, continuing to update uh, this guided forms library. So uh, I hope that is a helpful overview. Just wanna make sure that everyone's aware of all those resources. Now, let's start talking about the buyer advisory, which is the topic of today's class. And the thing, uh, first I wanna show you where to find it. So, uh, there's a few places that you can find the buyer advisory. It's in your forms library uh, with your vendor. If So Oregon Realtors is on Dotloop, Skyslope, and Zip Forms. So if you're using any of those and um, you have the Oregon for Forms library, then form 10.1 is the buyer advisory and you will find it within your forms library. Uh, if you need any help learning how to access our forms in these platforms, uh, we have instructions here uh, on our forms page, and uh, you can also reach out to us. The other place that you can get the uh, buyer and seller advisory, uh, if you click here on review all forms, we have a version of it in here as well that you can get sort of outside of your forms vendor. And we actually have a couple of different versions here. Uh, we had some comments uh, that we received that the versions inside of the vendor platforms, which re require a or have a space for a initials uh, for the buyer on each page. A lot of folks felt that was too onerous. Uh, we're working on updating the versions that are in the vendor platform to remove the initials on every page. But if you want to access a version of the advisory currently that does not have a space for initials on every page, we do have that uh, here on the website and you can uh, grab it from here. The only difference is that the type is a little bit smaller, so it's fewer number of pages and there are not a, uh, is not a space for initials on every page. All right, so let me go back to our presentation here. Sorry about that. All right, let's talk about why we want to use the buyer advisory. So the first reason, eh, sorry, I'm gonna move my little screen here. Okay, the, um, the first reason is that it's a wonderful tool to help increase your client's knowledge and competence related to what is likely the biggest purchase of their life. And it may be the first time that they've purchased a home. Um, and there's just a lot of things that they don't know. And the reason why we have this document, it is a lengthy document. It's, you know, roughly 30 pages, but that's because it has all of the important information that a person purchasing a home would want to know. Um, you can't expect that a, that a person entering this type of a transaction is really familiar with all of the aspects of it. And so you uh, can help your client become 
more prepared and competent to enter this transaction by providing this to them uh, at the beginning of your relationship. You're also going to be demonstrating your value because you're bringing this wonderful resource to the table that's not only telling them about all the important things that they're about to face as a purchaser of a home, but also linking them to a wealth of resources where they can find additional information and where they can find professionals that can help them, uh, whether that be, you know, uh, inspections, um, you know, or uh, other issues where they need to follow up for additional information. Uh, particularly now, with so much information out there on the internet that may or may not be reliable information and a growing portion of the information out there actually written by AI. Uh, or, you know, if you Google, uh, what do I need to know when purchasing a home? You may get a lot of hits. You don't know if that was written by an attorney, if it was written by a chat bot. So uh, you're delivering something really of value that was written by the experts from your association that you can give to your client that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. We're also trying to prevent claims against you, the agent, for violations of your duties under Oregon real estate licensing laws and the NAR code of ethics. Okay, and we'll talk more about that here in a minute. We're also trying to prevent claims of negligence. Okay, um, so the previous bullet point, we're talking about a claim that's brought against you at the real estate agency for violating your duties or brought to uh, the real estate association for a code of ethics, but we're also concerned about a negligence claim uh, that you did not live up to your standard of care and that your client was harmed as a result um, and they bring a lawsuit against you. Uh, what the buyer advisory does is it provides evidentiary an evidentiary defense in the case these claims are brought against you, okay? It's not the only thing. <laughs> that you need, it's not the only thing that you need to do, but it is a piece of documented written evidence that will demonstrate that you had advised your client on particular issues and advised them where to go seek additional information about those issues. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. So this is ORS 696301. This is the statute that provides the grounds for discipline, uh, empowering the real estate commissioner to uh, issue sanctions and reprimands against a real estate licensee, including the power of suspending or revoking the real estate license of any real estate licensee, okay? And if you look at number 15 down there, it's sort of a catch-all, engaging in any conduct that is below the standard of care for the practice of professional real estate activity in Oregon as established by the community of individuals engaged in the practice of professional real estate activity in Oregon. So uh, I can tell you that your client, if they are harmed, okay, they are likely to claim that you, that your failure to advise them on a particular issue was acting below the standard of care. And frankly, they, they in that case, they likely have a pretty good argument. Um, there are tools out there for you to advise your client about issues that they are facing. The buyer advisor being, advisory being a key one of those. Um, the standard of care for practice of professional real estate activity in Oregon includes advising your clients on issues that you're aware of because you're a professional real estate agent and they hired you for your professional expertise, but they are not aware of because they're not a professional home purchaser, okay? And so uh, the fact that, um, you know, and the fact that these tools are available to you um, actually is a factor that's going to be taken into account there because, uh, if this is something provided by your real estate association, if it's something that you have access to that you could have provided to your client, you know, that's going to be one of those questions that comes up when evaluating what is the standard of care is providing these types of advisories to a client part of that standard of care. Um, I'm not here to conclusively tell you whether providing a buyer advisory 
you know, not providing a buyer advisory means you're acting below the standard of care. But what I'm telling you is by providing the buyer advisory, you will have a great demonstration that you uh, related to providing advice to your client on important issues that will come up that you uh, were acting within that standard of care. And that's why we provide it. It's a tool for you to be able to help meet this standard here. Uh, now let's talk about a negligence claim. So this is when a client's going, you know, if a client was harmed uh, in a real estate transaction and they uh, believed that the real estate agent was a cause of that harm, okay, then we're, th 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 this statute here is actually representing what the pleading requirements are. And if you look here at what it says, and I highlighted a piece here, um, but if you look here what it says that uh, when bringing a claim against a real estate licensee uh, for negligence, okay, this is for a negligence claim, then uh, the attorney should bring forward okay, a, um, uh, a, a, sorry, let me just read this real quick, but okay, yeah, so the, 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 the attorney is going to bring forward information that they had consulted with and identified a real estate agent, okay, in the state who will testify as to the standard of care that as applicable in this case, including that the alleged conduct of the real estate licensee failed to meet the standard of care. Okay, and why is that? Because if if you're bringing a claim and there's a standard of care that's based on the industry, you need to have evidence and expertise from the industry that is defining what that standard of care is. So given that your many of your peers are advising their clients on these issues, many of your peers are providing the buyer advisory to your client. If your client were to bring a claim against you related to failure to inform or advise them about something, there probably are real estate agents out there who would be a willing to testify to the fact that you had acted below the standard of care by not providing uh, that information to your client. Okay, so again, here, by demonstrating that you've provided an advisory to your client that informs them of really important information uh, and issues that may come up in their transaction, you're going to have the documented evidence of that. Uh, so this is sort of the anatomy of a negligence claim if it came forward. The client would say, I was harmed by X, whatever it might be. Um, maybe it's uh, radon, okay? Maybe it's, uh, uh, and they were actually harmed uh, physically. Um, and there was uh, additional associated financial damages uh, and costs associated with, with, with that condition as well. Maybe it was an underground oil tank that they weren't aware of and that they then had to deal with, okay? be many things. Um, but I was harmed by X. My real estate agent failed to warn or advise me about X. My real estate agent had a duty to warn or advise me about X. And a reasonable real estate agent standing in the shoes of my agent would have warned me about X. Therefore, my real estate agent was acting below the standard of care for the industry, and they breached their duty to me. Had I been warned or advised about X, I would have done Y. Okay, and why it may have been, I would have gotten it, the property tested for radon. I would have asked for a uh, uh, inspection for an underground oil tank, whatever it might be. Uh, and that would have prevented the harm that I suffered. Therefore, the agent's breach of their duty by failing to warn or advise me about X was the cause of my harm. Okay, so this is the claim that's going to come against you if your client believes you were negligent and not warning or advising them about something. So I reached out to some folks who deal with these claims on a daily basis, okay, who are uh, litigating these claims uh, in mediation and arbitration, which is where many of them are going in Oregon based on agreements that, uh, you know, standard agreements in Oregon. And uh, so here's a quote I got from a, a very experienced uh, Oregon mediator and arbitrator. They said that, a signed Oregon Realtors buyer advisory is often the first piece of evidence that is presented by the defendant real estate agent's E&O insurance attorney in a mediation of a negligence claim 
to demonstrate that the agent met their duty of care to the client by properly informing them of the issue that gave rise to the dispute and also pointing the client to where to seek additional advice, okay? So is this the end of your negligence claim? No, but is it a key piece of information and evidence that you could, that you would be able to present to say, hey, client, I actually told you about that, okay? Um, and you've signed this document here saying that you, uh, you know, had received uh, this information that I provided to you. So uh, it, it really is uh, kind of a baseline of defense against these claims. Again, it's not the only thing. There's a lot of other issues that are going to come into that analysis, but you want to have this as a baseline. And, you know, what I've heard in talking to people about this is that oftentimes, uh, when you can point to the written advisory that the client had, had signed and said they had received, that that will significantly expedite this process, much make it much more likely that this will be resolved at mediation and never even get to an arbitration claim. I talked to a principal broker of a very large uh, firm in uh, the Portland area who said that they had numerous they've had numerous complaints against the firm dismissed because they had evidence showing that they had advised their client in writing about the issue that was the subject of the complaint, okay? So there really are real world benefits to this as it relates to protecting yourself from liability. So let's talk about what I call the realtor liability paradox, okay? So on the one hand, if there are undisclosed defects related to the property and that results in damage to the buyer, that's likely going to lead to claims both against the listing agent for failure to disclose, okay, but also against the buyer's agent for failure to warn their client about that issue or the potentiality of that issue. On the other hand, we also know that if a broker takes it upon themselves to inspect the property or the title um, and get into too much detail, right, they may be acting outside the scope of their expertise. And if that's the case, they could be risking both their licensing, their license, uh, you know, com complaint against their license or an ethics complaint. Um, and they could be providing unreliable information to their client because they aren't a home inspector and they are not an attorney. Okay. So what do you do? What do you do about that? That that's a real paradox. There are conflicting uh, issues going on there, conflicting uh, values and messages being sent to a real estate agent about what are they supposed to do? So that is where the advisory really can come in. It allows you to be the source of the source of the information. So it provides enough detail on the topics in there to make the client aware of an issue or the potentiality of an issue, okay? Um, it's not the detail of a defect, right? But it is the information about, hey, you wanna inspect the property for X, Y, and Z, because that could be an issue, okay? And if you wanna find an inspector for that, here's where you would go to find it. Okay, here's things that come up in a transaction that could come up in your transaction. So it makes them aware of the of the issue. It provides the references and links to additional information. It is, instructs the clients to seek independent legal and financial advice, provides a lot of links actually directly to places where people can find outside experts on the particular issue that's the subject of that section of the advisory. So this is a tool that's trying to help you hit that sweet spot, you know, between those two um, kind of uh, diverging uh, 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 messages that you're trying to, you know, and issues that you're trying to resolve in that realtor liability paradox. That's what we're trying to do. It's not a perfect tool, okay? But it is uh, a baseline tool that everyone should use and it does, really help you try to hit that sweet spot. So let's talk about when and how you wanna use the buyer advisory. So you wanna present it to your client as early as possible in the relationship. Ideally, that's gonna be at an initial client consultation. So I don't know if everyone here does an initial client consultation. If you don't, would recommend that you do that. Um, I know you're, you're all moving fast. You might you know, get a call from an interested buyer and just start showing them homes. But it really does make sense to sit down with your client and set the expectations, okay? 
Uh, we're not talking about it today. We also, of course, encourage you to do a buyer representation agreement with your client. Okay, we have a separate class on that. We're not going to talk about it today. But having a consultation with your client where you sit down, provide them the advisories uh, is, is something that would be extremely helpful. The earlier you do it, the better, because a lot of the information that's contained in here is not just going to be relevant to the actual purchase and sale agreement, but to the process of buying a home. And you also want your client to be able to um, read this information. It's a lot of information. You want to give them time to uh, digest the information, to read it, to follow some of the links. And um, if you only do that right when they're entering a purchase and sale agreement, you've really robbed them of the opportunity to fully um, uh, dive into the information. You should continuously refer back to the advisory as relevant issues or questions come up. Okay. You've given it to them. You've given them an overview of what's in it. Okay, you don't have to sit down and go through all 30 pages, but hey, here's what this is. Here's why I'm giving it to you. Here's the type of information that's contained in here. Keep this with you and use it as a resource. You can then continuously refer back to it as questions come up. Um, in addition to providing whatever information that you can provide you know, verbally, you can also say, hey, remember also, there's a section in the advisory about that. I encourage you to go reread that. It has links to additional information and places where you can find professionals on that issue. Um, we do have a pay place in the advisory for the buyer to acknowledge receipt of it. Okay, have your buyer do that. That's going to be really important uh, to have that written evidence that they received it. Okay, uh, the advisory can be used whether you're using the Oregon, ultimately going to use the Oregon Realtors forms or the OREF forms. Although I will say that since we updated these along with our forms library, there are now a lot of references to particular Oregon Realtors forms. So if you are going to be using the OREF forms, it's also important to inform your client, and I would do so in writing, that uh, the references to specific form numbers aren't going to be relevant if they're using the OREF forms. Okay, I think that's an update and a change that we'll make to a future version of the advisory, we'll just write that in there and say, hey, you can use this with any set of forms, but know that the references to specific forms within here are related to the Oregon Realtors forms, okay? We just don't want the client to be confused or say, hey, I read this, it says that that's in form 1.1, but you gave me form 001, I'm confused, what is, what's going on? Um, the other thing is that our sale agreements at the Oregon Realtors actually, except for the commercial, actually require the use of both the buyer advisory and the seller advisory for the seller because the clients are going to be acknowledging in the sale agreement that they have received that from their agent and that they understand the information that's contained. That's intended to be sort of an extra step of that evidence that you have around um, that you actually presented the information to the client and that the client um, understood the information. So if there ever is a dispute that arises later, not only do you have evidence that they re acknowledged receipt, but also at the time of entering the sale agreement, evidence that they uh, understood the information that was contained within it. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the structure of the advisory. So the first section is uh, really purchase process issues. Okay, so these are sort of issues related to the overall process, not specific to the actual sale agreement. Uh, so here's where we're going to be talking about um, MLS data um, and, you know, letting the client understand, you know, helping the client understand, for example, that information in the MLS is not necessarily part of the contract unless you put it in the contract. Um, the procedures around offers and counter offers, uh, warnings about certain fair housing uh, risks, okay, um, including we have a section about love letters. Uh, Cautioning buyer about waiving or releasing their rights that they may have in the transaction that they'll be entering into. Talking about the escrow process and allocations and how that works. Uh, describing the termination process as it relates to real estate contracts. And then use of first right of refusal or right of first offer, uh, if that's going to be used. Not terribly common, um, but that's sort of a pre-sale agreement issue. So we have it in this category. Patrick, you had a question. Do you recommend providing a sample copy of the sale agreement at initial consultation and a copy of the forms referred to in the buyer advisory? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the more you can get your client prepared uh, so they're not seeing it the first time when they sign the agreement, the better. 
So I would say absolutely provide, uh, I mean, you know, if I tell you what I think, I would do a buyer representation agreement, I'd give them a buyer advisory, and I would provide them a copy of the sale agreement, okay? If you know what sale agreement you're using, you know, you can use the Oregon Realtors form. If you don't know what sale agreement you're going to ultimately use, you could give them a copy of both the OREF and the Oregon Realtors agreement. Thanks for that question. So the next section of the advisories is going to be our advisories that are specific to the purchase and sale agreements and the issues that are going to arise in the context of the purchase and sale agreement. So here we're going to talk about uh, things like FERPTA, uh, the Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act, uh, new construction issues, in case it may be a new construction uh, contract and the issues that are going to be needed dealt with in a contract specific to new construction. Uh, the different types of tests and inspections that a buyer should consider doing to the property. This is probably the bulkiest part of the document, one of the most important parts, because it's going to cover not just general home inspections, but issues like radon, oil tanks, lead paint and lead paint hazards, um, and other issues that may require specialty inspections beyond just a general home inspection. Okay, we talk about wells, we talk about septic systems. Um, talk about other dangers or risks that may be present on the property, including you know, a variety of environmental hazards. Talk about the sort of process and procedure for uh, negotiating repairs. We talk about title issues that come up. This is an important one because I think a lot of uh, buyers, particularly if it's the first time, um, you know, just not that familiar with uh, issues related to the title, not that familiar with easements, may not be that familiar with CCNRs um, and other issues that they should be looking for as they're reviewing that title report. Uh, we talk about the requirements around smoke and carbon monoxide alarms, which is obviously a critical safety issue. Uh, the seller property disclosure statement, both the obligations that the seller has, but also the rights that the buyer has to revoke their offer if this S you know, based upon the SBDS or if the SBDS was never delivered. Uh, we have a section specifically on issues related to vacant land. And then uh, we talk about uh, property tax related issues. The third section of the advisory, uh, these are additional important advisories, but not um, related specifically to the sale agreement. Um, here we talk about um, uh, the risks of mixing forms libraries. We talk about wire fraud. We also have a separate wire fraud advisory in the Oregon Realtors Forms Library. We tried to consolidate our advisories into this document so that you did not have, you know, a long list of separate individual page advisories that you had to be sending to your client. However, with wire fraud, we did create a separate one and we think that that's a good one to use independently as well because the real risk of the wire fraud, right, is in the email exchanges, in the sort of um, process of communicating and giving them something, uh, you know, directly right as they're going to be beginning doing those types of communications over uh, email with their title company and their lender. We think it's really good to have that as a standalone as well. And the volume of wire fraud is just going through the roof. So uh, we wanted to create that separately. We also have uh, issue uh, advisories here related to audio and video recordings in homes. Uh, homeowners insurance, uh, you know, how to uh, find different property related statistics, uh, short sale uh, and bank owned property issues. Um, and then some other issues that may not sort of be at front of mind or that you may not even be used to um, sort of mentioning to a client, but that could come up um, and that it's really helpful for the client to be aware of, but you also to be able to point to for example, the Visual Rights uh, uh, Artists Act, and we're going to talk about that here in, in a minute. Um, I have a slide specifically on that. So here are some of the detailed um, topics that are in each of these sections. I won't read all of these, but just to give you a sense of the comprehensive nature of what we're covering here. Obviously, there could be issues that we that we miss. Uh, however, if you believe that's the case, let us know and we will add them. But we really are trying to be comprehensive here um, and at least helping the buyer 
um, get an initial explanation and understanding of the issues that may come up and then pointing them to where to get more information. Obviously, we you know, are not writing a treatise on each of these topics, but we try to cover them in enough detail so that the uh, buyer is put on notice. Okay, the next one, uh, section two. Here are some of the topics that we cover. Defective products and materials, that's a key one. Um, you know, really important one for folks to be aware of. Uh, historic property that may or may not apply, but provide some background on that so that when you put that historic property addendum in front of them, it's not news to them. They, you know, have additional, you know, information and some context for that. Talk about home warranties. Sorry. Um, Seller carried financing again. That may not be something that's that is a part of every transaction, but uh, for those who are considering it, they'll have that information up front, uh, so that you're not starting that conversation at the time that you're making an offer for a seller carry transaction. And here's some of the topics on our. Um, I think I have these slides out of order, but here's a, some of the topics in section two. And in section three. And then the last page is the acknowledgement. So this is really important to have your buyer sign the acknowledgement. Um, it, they are also, in addition to acknowledging receipt, they're acknowledging that there may be other issues that are not covered by this advisory. Um, and of course, that the buyer is still responsible for making all necessary inquiries and consulting with appropriate uh, experts on the purchase of the property. Also that, um, you know, this is not legal advice. Okay, they still need to seek legal advice if that they're if they're looking for legal advice. Um, this is for general information, and uh, you know our own disclaimer because we try to keep this as updated as we can. But we do know we're linking to, you know, pages on the DEQ website about uh, wells, for example. You know, we can't control the fact that DEQ may update their links, and so there could be a period of time where the link is. Um, you know, inactive with that. Hopefully that isn't the case. Uh, we really do try to stay on top of it, but we just want to make the buyer aware of that. And uh, of course, you know, they should seek additional professional advice as needed. So let's talk about some topics in here and just, you know, highlight examples of why this can be really helpful to you to provide the advisory. So radon. So here's a good example of a portion of the advisory where we're providing uh, a, a good baseline level of information. When a first time home buyer is purchasing a home, they probably have never heard of radon. Okay. They don't know what it is. They don't know that it's a risk. They don't know that it's often found built up in homes. So here we're providing enough information. We're not overwhelming the buyer. We're telling them what it is. We're linking them to places for additional information. And we're letting them know that you as a real estate licensee um, are not an expert, but you can help direct them to professionals. Okay. So, you know, in, in just a short paragraph here, now the client knows what radon is. They know it's a health risk. They know where to find additional information. They know where to find additional information about finding a person to test. Okay. They know that you aren't the person they should rely on as the expert about radon but they know they can go and ask you more questions if they want to um, find out additional information about where to find a person to help them uh, test the radon. Uh, your job isn't done, okay? Obviously you should still remind your client about radon when it's time to write the offer. And frankly, I believe you should be recommending to your client to do a radon inspection. Of course, it's up to your client whether or not they do that. Um, and of course, in a competitive market, it's up to your client what they do and your client may be, you know, deciding that they want to kind of reduce the number of things that they're doing or asking, but 
you still want to be advising them to do it. And if the client later claims that they were not advised about radon, you now can point them to a document that they twice had said both that they received and that they understood. The credibility of that claim is going to be significantly reduced uh, if you have this written evidence that you provided them this information. Uh, now, why does that matter? Well, this is a, a headline from uh, Minnesota, I believe, but radon testing in that state, it's probably the same here, declined 40% in 2022 because the market was hot. People were making, trying to make competitive offers and they were waiving inspections or not doing certain additional uh, inspections like radon. So uh, well, what does that mean? Well, if 40% fewer people doing radon inspections, that certainly is gonna mean that there are homes with high levels of radon that did not get caught, okay? And nobody knew and the client is now living in that home. And if there is damage to that client down the road, or if they learn that there is significant radon buildup and they have to invest expense into trying to remedy that, they're going to be upset. Um, and you can now show that you provided them information. And if they chose to waive their radon inspection, that's they're the client, it's their choice. You can't control that. Uh, but when they say, you didn't tell me that radon was a health risk, you can say, no, in fact, I did. Uh, let me see that question there. Yeah, there is a site, Wanda, there is a site where the presence of radon is broken down uh, by areas of Oregon. In fact, that's the site we linked to in the buyer advisory. Um, so I don't have that link right in front of me, but if you pull up the buyer advisory and click on the link to the Oregon Health Authority, uh, on that page, it will show you where that map exists. Thanks. And that's again, another good example uh, why those links in the buyer advisory are so important because uh, it really does allow your buyer to do research and find additional information and see the context and understand to a greater degree what their risk is. Because if they pull up that map and see that their area has a high level of radon, then they're more likely going to do follow-up questions and want to um, and want to do that uh, that that test. Um, and uh, you know, you may or may not know that that area has particularly. Um, that particular neighborhood has a high level of radon, but you're providing them with information to click a link to be able to go see that map. Okay, um, let's talk about some other examples where this could be really important. So CCNRs, I think this is a really, really important one. Uh, I don't think most buyers understand what they're looking for when they receive a preliminary title report. Okay. Um, and I think that there are situations that arise where a buyer may be restricted in cert doing certain things with their property that they weren't aware of. Okay? And some things pop more obviously in a preliminary title report, like there's some you know, major easement or other encumbrance on the property, but maybe there's CCNR um, related to not being able to use the home uh, for a commercial purpose, like a daycare, something like that, or limitations on whether you can do, um, you know, a garden on your balcony or just a variety of things. There could be limitations that might be really important to that unique particular buyer. It might not be that important to every buyer, but might be important to that particular buyer. Um, and so providing information about CCNRs so that they understand that, hey, there could be restrictions on the use of this property um, and you really need to look into that. I think that's going to be something, or that is something that's extremely helpful. Uh, obviously, you know, when you receive the title report and you provide it to them, you want to point out to them, hey, you really need to read this and make sure that there aren't things in there that you're not comfortable with. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you aren't the, um, legal expert on all of these issues and so you want to be able to point them to information that you provided to them that warn them that there could be restrictions on the use of their property and then inform them how to get more information on that 
underground oil storage tanks. Okay, this is uh, a huge source of uh, liability, both for sellers, but also for our buyers, uh, because they might not be aware that that tank even exists. Well, and again, here, if it's a uh, not even a first time home buyer, but certainly a first time home buyer, they might not be aware that there there's a chance that there's an underground oil tank. Okay, so it may not even cross their mind. So you're making them aware of it. Uh, there's huge liability associated with that. Um, if there's a leak and it's not cleaned up and sometimes the seller doesn't even know that there's a, you know, does not just know that there's a tank. And if a buyer buys a house and they didn't, then they didn't locate a tank and the seller that they bought it from didn't know that there was a tank. Now that buyer is going to be a future seller who's selling a home to somebody that had an underground tank and that buyer never even knew it. And maybe they never even knew to ask the question. So again, here we provide enough information so that the uh, buyer understands a tank could be present. They understand the basics of Oregon's oil tank laws. They have the links to information where they can uh, you know, get, get additional details and information. And you'll be able to point to this to show that you uh, in fact did advise them that there could be an underground oil tank. And the information that was relevant to them uh, as to what they might want to do about that. Uh, so yeah, this just, you know, there, there's a lot of stories out there about uh, oil tanks coming back to haunt people. And, and again, the buyer may be the buyer in this instance, but they're gonna be the seller in a future instance. Uh, and so this, this issue is going to carry on with them if it's something that they failed to investigate. Um, there might be some issues that like may otherwise not come up or that you may not be that familiar with. Some of these issues you're very, very familiar with, you're already going to be kind of coaching your client uh, as you're writing the offer about inspections and what they might want to inspect. But there may be some other more obscure issues that you want to be able to point to some written guidance and evidence on that may not otherwise come up in the transaction. Um, so we got a call a few years ago from the backflow inspector for a major city in Oregon who said, hey, uh, we're finding that a whole bunch of people are buying homes, not doing a backflow inspection, um, not knowing if there's appropriate backflow prevention device um, associated with an irrigation system. And we're coming to do our annual check uh, on backflow and they're finding that either they have to install a device that they didn't, they weren't aware of that, or that their device is insufficient, uh, or they just didn't even know that that they had to be responsible for an annual check on the uh, functioning of the backflow device. So we said, well, great, we'll put that in our buyer advisory so that buyers are now aware of that. Um, so this is an issue that maybe isn't a frequent one that's coming up as part of the inspection process, but should. And, uh, you know, so, so here you are able to show that you provided your buy buyer with evidence of that. Now, I would encourage you on this one, too, to have conversations with your buyer about this if, if there may be an irrigation system involved, uh, because it's something that can be relatively easily um, inspected. Uh, another one I want to talk about is this Visual Artist Rights Act. Okay, this is something that you probably haven't been talking about in your transactions, um, but you maybe you should start talking about it. But at the very least, you want to be able to point that you provided your buyer with information on this. Um, so, if there is custom-made artwork uh, that is connected to the property, and this might be really relevant in a commercial transaction, for example, uh, where uh, there may be a mural painted on a building, that artist may have rights in that artwork independent of the seller of the property, okay? So the buyer is thinking, oh, this is just graffiti on this property. I'm gonna paint over it when I buy it, but they may actually be restricted from doing that. And if they do do that, they may actually have to pay significant damages to the artists of the uh, of the mural. Uh, so, uh, like here's an example of a case where the uh, graffiti artist successfully uh, sued a property owner for painting over a mural. There's a picture of the building there, and I think there was 45 
individuals who were involved in doing the graffiti on that building and they all brought claims and uh each of those claims was um somewhere in the you know hundred and something thousand dollar range and the total award was 6.5 million to the 45 different graffiti artists um so is this going to be a major topic of conversation with your clients probably not but is it a really good thing to be able to point that you to that you provided them some information on this topic uh, so they can't later claim that they were unaware? Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Uh, I see there's a question here. So uh, Eldon, backflow is gonna be required not based on the age of the home, but on um, whether there is an irrigation system because the city needs to protect uh, the public water source from any potential contaminants coming back from the the individual property. So it's going to not be related to the age of the home, but um, to the existence of the uh, irrigation system. Uh, graffiti, is this frivolous? Well, again, some people might think this is fr frivolous, but this was an act of Congress back in 1990 uh, that said, hey, rights and artwork don't, in, in some types of artwork don't just uh, accrue to the person who purchased them, but there's an interest in protecting the artists as well uh, to create incentive for that art to keep, you know, uh, you know, for that art to be continue to be created, specifically as it relates to things like murals. Um, uh, and so Congress didn't think that it was, uh, you know, uh, a, a joke or petty, they thought it was important. And so Again, it's not something that comes up all the time, but it's something that you now can point. If it did come up, you can point uh, to evidence that you informed your client about it. Do you know if the graffiti artist had rights in writing or was it needed? Um, yeah, Patrick, thanks. That's a good question. Um, I'd have to look at the statute, but I don't think that a contractual right in writing is the is the issue that the case turns on and that could probably could be helpful but that, i don't think that's the, the the main issue that the case would turn on will tagging become art Eldon, yes yeah, so i'm not an expert in in like what is and is not art i'm just more trying to let you know that like hey there are some issues that you may not regularly be talking to your client about because they're kind of obscure uh but they still could create significant liability and we're covering some of those issues in this advisory so that you can demonstrate that you informed your client. But if people are interested, we will do a class just on the Visual Artist Rights Act. So I think that would be an interesting class. So we'll, um, we'll work on that. Where would one find out if something painted on the side of a house of a building would fall under this? Do artists have to register their art? What would they? What if they are deceased? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the first place to start uh, would be to ask the seller. Okay, so if a buyer is in a position of purchasing a home, and there is a mural on the property, and the buyer want you know having a conversation with the seller to try to understand what the source of that artwork was, and then um, you know if that information wasn't available, you'd have to do continued investigating. Uh, you might be able to find uh, like uh, that that the work, the intellectual property was registered with like the U.S. Copyright Office or something like that. But, um, you, you know, essentially you have to sleuth, you know, you got to sleuth around to find uh, to find out. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Uh, we can go for a couple more minutes here. Um, I have to do the open house here shortly, uh, so I'll need to hop off within the next few minutes. but. I didn't have any more material presented, but happy to answer any questions that come up. Becky, what if you can't find the artist? Well, if you think it's something that could be covered by the Visual Artist Rights Act and you can't find the artist, um, you probably don't want to paint over it, right? You, you probably want to just keep sleuth it around until you can find the information that you need. It's an imperfect, it's not a perfect science, but uh, you'd want to, you'd, you'd want to just keep digging until you can find it. 
All right. Any other questions? I think the backflow issues are not just irrigation, as I'm going to prolong flooding in the basement due to no backflow device. Yeah. So, Kathy, it's true that. Um, you know, for example, like even with a hose or something, the, you know, you, you could have backflow issues into your into your house, but the requirement of the county and or the city um, and then which are then also governed by some overarching state laws uh, are related to irrigation devices. Yeah. And that's where so there could be issues that come up in the particular home that could be relevant, but in terms of a buyer like having to pay having the city knock on their door and tell them they have to pay for a backflow device or that their backflow device is not functioning um or not being aware that they had to annually certify that the backflow device was functioning all of those things are going to be related to um having an irrigation system all right Great. Well, thanks everyone for the class uh, for coming. Next week we're going to do. Um, oh, next week we're going to do seller advisory, and if folks want to hop on and learn more about other forums or ask questions on other forums, you can hop on to our eleven o'clock open house. It's a different Zoom meeting. You can find the link on the forums website. And uh, Patrick, have we thought about providing hard copies? You know, I think we used to, and then we shifted to um, to PDF online copies, just because that was the way the world was going. Uh, but you know, if that's something the members wanted, we'd be interested in hearing that. So I'd encourage you to provide that feedback. Of course, you also can print them out. Um, but maybe it's something we charge members a little extra for because it'd be an expense. But we say, you know, hey, you know, if you want, you know, a hard copy, then you know we can mail you one. Um, you know, and just you know have an expense, small expense to cover our costs. So. Let me know if you think that's something worthwhile, but uh, it's not something that we currently have in the works. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to hop over to the open house and we will see you on the next webinar. Take care.